Well, I tell you what, let me go ahead and start. Um, yesterday, I sort of introduced myself and why I'm here. You know, it's when you are working in these higher yield types of environments with a few select growers, they ask so many different questions that we really don't have a lot of good answers. And so what we try to do now is get on these fields, start experimenting with them, and beginning to peel apart the formula of yield, of what it takes. And so, to me, guys, one of the things that I always remark and we have always get agreement with is the only way really to do this is understand, you know, the path, the pathways, understand corn yield, basically yield components and how they're formed and how we limit stress. That's really what's important. It's, we don't want to slow this crop down at all. Because whatever the yield is going to allow us to produce, that crop to produce, it's important. So we don't want to be a part of that stress. So that's really kind of what I want to do. And, and I also mentioned that an economist from Texas who surveyed uh, yesterday, who surveyed uh, the, uh, a couple of years ago, top CEO in agricultural companies, and said, hey, what's the key to your success? And, and in words, he summed up saying they all told him basically the same thing. We reject the status quo. In other words, we reject sitting back on our laurels. We reject being satisfied. And I think really that's the way we all are to live. We all are to look at and measure our success as here today, gone tomorrow. Okay? We have to operate in a continuous mode. Huh? No, it's, uh, this is for uh, that. This is not a mic that's out here. Thanks so much. But just hang it down. Oh, is it? <laughs> All this hearing right now is just <laughs> scrub, 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 you know. Man, what the heck? All right, thank you. I hope I can keep it on. Thank you. Should have said, do it, you idiot. Then I'm answering you. <laughs> I get called that a little bit, you know. So the important part is understanding if you see this thing hanging down again, you know, if I drop it off, y'all let me know, please. All right. <laughs> All right. So the important part is recognizing the growth and development because here's what I like to show people. What happens here ultimately affects yield all year long. Okay, so stress that occurs here tends to begin to cap the yield potential. So it will affect what happens here. It will affect what happens at silking. It will affect what's happening up in this stage of growth. Why? Sometimes we have, uh, and, 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 I'm, and I'm, I spoke of it as this way, yield is clutter. In other words, it's an effect if, of the stress of the genetic potential. The genetic potential of our hybrids exceeds what we're able to achieve. So that yield out there is literally the absence of stress throughout that season. It builds. And so what we're trying to do and what I'm suggesting we need to look at is let's look at how we might affect plant growth rate. And actually that begins here. Everything that we do from pre-planting on is going to affect that. Now that's sort of hard to begin to grasp because what we're doing, what I'm saying is we need to look at the rooting structure and in a plant, and remember I said this yesterday, a plant that's root growth is maximum for whatever that means in that year, is sending signals to that, to that plant, cytokine hormones, sending signals is saying, hey man, I got everything I need here, go get it. Give me everything you've got. Produce as much as you can. But if it's under stress, it's saying, whoa, stop, stop, slow down. I can't keep up with you. I'm going to stress. We're stressing. So you see, let's think about it that way. We want to reduce the clutter. We want to reduce all those things that are going to negatively affect growth from the very beginning. So as we go into this reproductive phase, as we're stretching out the number of kernels, as we are setting all those ovules that were set back here, and then, what, affecting test weight. We affect growth rate. We do not want to be a part of the problem. 
That's the key. So how can we do that economically? How can we look at it and say, guys, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll try it this way, okay? <coughs> Hopefully this will work. You may need some help. <coughs> So if you're listening to this, you're wondering if I'm hurting yourself again. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we are. Maybe you'll say All right. All right, so what we want to do here again, guys, is look at the corn growth and development. This is so important from the very beginning. Let's understand. And yesterday I ended by saying, look, guys, we need to know our hybrids. When you know them well, we can push them too far, we can create problems. So hybrids are extremely important. <coughs> Even emergence is exceedingly important because I'll show you a little bit later that's going to show you some of the negative stress and negative effects. Corn plants do make bad neighbors. Mark Witt, Westgate, that's one of the things he told me. He said, dude, corn plants just really make bad neighbors. They don't like each other. Right? And that's somewhat true. We want to plan to reduce stress, react immediately to any type of suspicion. We want to try to maintain a balanced and higher tissue than what we normally are going to see. Why do I say that? And I'll show you some data, uh, show you some information later on that that disturbs me as an agronomist and the lack of data that we have in the land grant institution. In some cases, we are catching up with these guys. And it's alright to say that. Don't you think? <clears throat> I think so. Well hey Bob. Don't you think? No. Alrighty, good. So <laughs> you bet. All right, we want to protect from, from pests. We, we, please, please, I'd say be willing to experiment on your farm. All right, so that's the way I ended it yesterday. Now, Bob was so kind to tell people yesterday, and I agree with him fully, and so would Richard, is guys, we need a proper planting depth. All right, I like two inches. In our sandy soils, if I'm an inch and a half, I've got problems. If I'm an inch, I've got problems. All right. If you're two, two and a half inches, much fewer problems. And I'll show you some information here from a colleague of mine that easily illustrates that, okay? I want even plant emergence. It's very important as we move towards these higher yield goals. Now, now Bob, you made a statement yesterday, and, and I agree and I somewhat disagree, okay? And, and, and here's what, and this is part of the reason I disagree, because as we unmask some of the yields, when we're in this 200, 250 bushel range, that clutter of stress is affecting yield. We tend to lose, I think, some of that plant growth rate impact. In a 215 study this past year on, a, uh, on these high yield environments, we had even plant emergence. I mean, uh, we had in the first 12 hours of the first plant coming up, we had 85% of the plants emerged. I had on my uh, research farm 90%. Those late plants, as at the end of the year, they're tagged. At the end of the year, we showed a 28% reduction in kernels. Okay, 28%. Now, in the whole scheme of things, that's minor, but it's part of it. Right. Um, this was Ronnie Heiner over North Carolina State, doing the same thing. He was looking at the first emergence of plants and then tagged those and then went back and tagged those that emerged 24 to 48 hours later. And he really did a kind of unique thing. He used uh, golf tees, colored golf tees. And I've been using these big old flags, you know. And he used these nice little colored golf tees. And I thought that was pretty cool, you know. And so he was measuring them. And so what he looked at was this. He looked at, okay, what is the total cob uh, ear weight, all right? Here was the total ear weight in grams. Of the first ones that emerged and those that were 24 to 48 hours later, okay? So about 340 versus just under 300 uh, grams. The number of rows was not significantly affected. The number of kernels, we went from about uh, 30, oh, I don't know, I think he said it was 30, average about 34, 34.3 to about 31, okay? Now that's an effect. That is an effect. The yields relatively small, but still in effect. Now this one was interesting to me. Uh, this past year he shared this data with me. He said, I used two different hybrids, planted it one and a half inches and I planted it two and a half inches. All right. This is the emergence of plants 
on first emerged plants of Pioneer 1319, or the percentage that said, and Pioneer 1456, and he used some different in, uh, uh, infrared types of treatments looking to see if there was an effect there. Minor effect, statistically, not valid, but look at this. First emergers, all right, right in here, two and a half inches versus one and a half inch. Well, I see a lot of confused faces, and I agree with that. Why? What was going on? Remember, Bob said something yesterday about it. Cool temperatures, you like soils, they get moisture. Actually, you see that wet and dry effect. Exactly right. So here we have a seed that's nested one and a half inches versus another inch. And the importance is understanding what happened. Temperature, cooler temperatures, slightly wetter conditions, later, the cooler temperatures affected, negatively affected at that inch and a half versus where? That seed was in moist, warmer soils at two and a half inches deep versus one and a half inches. That's the difference. And you know, Bob related that to you yesterday of how cooler environments can affect that seedling emergence. And that's what's important. So my take home message really is at that planting time, you know, look at what those coming temperatures, if you're fixing to get a, if it's early in the season, you're fixing to get a very cold rain, I would hold off. You say, well, I'm, I got dry soils. Hey, that's even better. Hold off, let it get wet. Give yourself a couple more days, let it warm up, then plant. But don't plant in these early colder temperatures when soil temperatures are 58 degrees, 59 degrees, and you're fixing to get that 40 degree water that's going to hit that ground, you know, and cool that. So it's just being smart and not being part of the problem. And that's all. That's all we're talking about. Okay? And depth is important to cushion that seed. Now I'm going to tell you something, guys. These seeds have plenty of energy to get out of the ground here. All right? Um, and this is the differences in the 24-hour emergence, obviously, uh, in the 1319 and the 1458. That next 24 hours, guys, uh, after that uh, initial emergence, we are picking up steam and getting that. So we were a day behind the majority in that 1319. Could it have been affected by uh, seed energy? No, it was not that. It was death. Simple death. Okay? I want you to do your homework. If you're a grower, I want you to test hybrids on your farm, many of them, several of them, and do a good job. Why is that? Because whatever your management scheme is to achieve and break your bar break these barriers down, hybrids are going to be a part of it. You don't want to risk failure. And so if you look at that, here we are, we have a nice, pretty, growing uh, variety trial on a farm pushed rather hard, but disaster can strike when we have high populations, maybe high winds, okay? But you can see that there are some positive effects out there by hybrids, okay? So lodging the capability to stand under those types of environments, there. And so by doing your own tests on your farm, because one of the things that's important, we try our best Okay, Dr. Taylor, Dr. Nielsen back there. We try our best since we're sharing information on very limited uh, space and very limited studies to give you the best idea. But the best idea, quite honestly, guys, is on your farm. Do not be afraid. Be willing. Do not be afraid to do your own trials. Replicate. Understand what the effect that your microclimate is having, please. How about plant population. 25, 35, 45,000 plants per acre. Well, we actually made higher yields with our 45,000 plants, but it really wasn't statistically different here. What's important, though, is understanding how yield is built and trying to have the positive effect. We want to make sure that we get our target number of years per acre, whatever that might be in your, in your scheme, to maximize the number of kernels to get in uh, when we get to uh, kernel field, have the highest test weight possible. What we really want to do, guys, is capture 95 to 100 percent of that life. And it comes in different configurations. Now, 
Dr. Westgate, you know, here again, I've, I've used his name several times, but I've looked at these studies, you know, in the Midwest and looked at, okay, what is this population effect? And we've seen that population effect rise as we get to newer and newer hybrids from 32,000 to 33, 34, we're seeing that. Where that stops, I'm not really sure. But when we look at the amount of light captured in studies, we see typically that we're reaching that 95% maximum light interception around 40,000 plants. Now, Randy Dowdy did his 500 bushel corn with 50,000 plants, but he doesn't do that routinely. He routinely puts out 38 to 40,000 plants. And he's not routinely making 500 bushels either. But he was wanting to see in that year, what, he, what, what could I do? How much would plants be affected by Or how many, how would plant population affect them? <coughs> and this is some work from, here again, my uh, colleague, uh, Ron Heinegger. If you'll look at this, this is uh, plant population here, yield by plant population, and this is yield by light interception. And you can see they correlate pretty darn well at about 33, 34,000 plants. Okay? And if you look at it, if you think about the mathematics of it, that's not hard to achieve. It's not hard to achieve in this case, all right, in this case he was approaching 275, 278 uh, bushels. Not bad. Okay. So it's not always just about pushing the plant population. It's about what we do with that plant. How can we capture, how do we maximize that light interception? And if it's with row width, then so be it. Uh, when we've done studies in uh, Georgia, uh, albeit it's different, we use 36 inches there because of corn and, I mean, because of cotton and peanuts. We use twin rows, we use 30 inch corn. We, I mean, yeah, and 20 inch corn and even 15 inch corn. We got farmers going from 15 to 38 inches, all right? And what I try to tell these guys, they said, Dewey, um, you know, am I going to be better off going in narrow rows? And I tell them, guys, after seven years of studies at 30,000 plants, yeah, I got this nice, beautiful effect, significant effect, going from 36 inches down to 20 inches. It was really nice, a nice response. But I said, it's about plant interception. It's about light. It's about plant mass. Use the row width according to your farm needs. Can you achieve it all on 30 inches? Yes, we do. Can we achieve it at 15 inches? Yes, we do. Okay. Can you manage 15 inch corn as well as you can manage 30 inch corn? That's up to you, I don't know. It's easier to conduct tillage for 30 inch than it is for 15 inch. And tillage is extremely important when it comes to rooting. So what I'm suggesting to you is if you are a corn sorbing guy and you like 15, 20 inches, you can do it with that. We can. But tillage and the, the tillage is going to be exceedingly important in corn. Soybeans. Soybeans, I think, and uh, Richard, I probably need your help, and Bob, I probably need your help in this. Soybeans aren't source limited, I think. Corn is sink limited. So, narrowing those rows, getting those plant population is a little bit more important than it is in corn. Would you say? I don't know. Richard? I agree. Would you? Okay, good. I need you some help. I need some confidence there, okay? I just was a, I, I make that statement and I always want to make sure with these days, today's lines that that's exactly true and that we're continuing to see that. So that's to me very important. So if that narrow rule fits your, your corn production, I mean your soybean production, then it's going to fit your corn production as well, okay? Why? Guys, increased leaf area index correlates with increased light interception, which correlates with an increased photosynthetic activity, okay? So here we've got some studies that are showing this nice leaf area. At silking stage, we're reaching maximum leaf area production. Well, that's obvious because now the castle's out. So the, the leaf tissue is fully expanded, okay? And when we get that, guys, we get that uh, 95 to 100% of photosynthetic rate. Now, what does that mean? It means as we increase that photosynthesis, we increase biomass and ultimately we increase yield. Why? Because we're increasing the interceptive photosynthetically active radiation. That's what we're capturing. And that's what's so important. So as we look at above ground biomass, we're seeing that nice little linear uh, expression, guys. Here is we're maximizing what? Growth rate. Growth rate. 
I, this is something that's very important to me. I want signaling from the very beginning in these roots that I'm a happy camper. Right? Why? Because now gen genetically the plant is responding to it and sending those cytokines up that stalk to that plant saying grow, grow baby grow. Right? And that's what we're looking for. Some of the next frontiers for us, and in and, and my science, we're sort of struggling a little bit, and Richard, you may agree, Bob, you may agree, maybe y'all disagree. Uh, this is just my opinion. Uh, I think we're struggling a little bit with the biologicals, we're struggling a little bit with the humic acids, we're struggling a little bit with the hormones only because we're trying to approach this in a manner that we can say we get a significant response. And here's our problem. Our problem is, not many of us are doing 400 bushel corn. You know, we're just not. Not many of us are doing 375 corn or 350 corn. But that's where we gotta go. Those are the things that we're gonna have to do. Because if you start thinking about it, we still have three dollars and a half corn. And I can look back on all the years and it's three dollars and a half. And guess what? That three dollars and a half doesn't buy near as much as it used to, right? So it's our science. Our science has got to catch up in some ways to what these guys do. That's it. I'll acknowledge that. But we're struggling. We're going after it. We should go after it. You should encourage your agronomist, your wee scientist, your pathologist to start doing this, not to, to reject the status quo. Okay? Uh, I said something one time, and, and Richard is about to retire here, I think, sometime soon. Yeah. Very soon. Bob, Bob and I were talking about that last night, about a little bit of retirement. I've retired, I'm gonna rehire. You know, there's three old guys here. And it's these young guys that have got to tackle these problems. You gotta push your university, you gotta push your legislators. You gotta to say to them, guys, we need these people out here. We need them to help us achieve what's going to be, what? Our future and corn production, soybean production, peanuts, cotton, whatever it might be, all right? Now, here, plant tissue, prior to the B stage, B6 stage, you should be considering some uh, analysis, plant analysis. Now, why is this important? One, you wanna map that tissue analysis on your fields throughout the next few years. Set aside some money for yourself for research, get help, get help through your extension office, get help from your consultant, from your, uh, from the business, from business agronomists, from anyone that can help you interpret this data, even statistically analyze it, because I've always said replicate it on your farm. Let's look at how you affect that plant and release that plant to capture the most yield. Now, you will find that in most universities and most labs that this is sufficiency ranges. 4% nitrogen to 5%. Richard, I would expect that's about the same for y'all. Bob's probably the same for in Purdue. 0.3% in phosphorus to 0.5. Okay, 2.5 to 4. And guys, and if you start looking at it, there's a level of balance in here. I'll acknowledge that aspect of it. It's very, very important, I think. Because why? Cations will compete with cations. Calcium levels go straight up out of the roof. They're going to compete with magnesium. Potassium, same way. They may compete with magnesium. Ammonia, it's a cation, ammonia. We put ammonium nitrate fertilizer. It's, it's not hard to see a, a competitive environment so that I get a magnesium um, deficiency symptom. It is not hard for me to do that. And I see that magnesium levels are still high enough, they're in the sufficiency range. But you try to you try to put enough Epsom salt on the field when you've got 350 units of nitrogen you just put out there from ammonium nitrate and it ain't going up in the plant. There's just competitive ionic effects there, right? But what's important to me is how we might balance that early on and how we may continue to do that. See, that's one thing I like about irrigation. You guys that irrigated, I love it because I can inject through the system. I inject nitrogen, I can inject clear potash. If I'm seeing that maybe I've made a mistake and I don't have enough later in the season, I can inject fungicides very, very successfully and have great effect on disease and protect that crop. So that, in, that 
center pivot is going to do more for you than just deliver water. It's going to do more. And it's designed to prevent stress. Guys, see, that's the thing about it. We do not want to be a part of the stress. We want that plant growth to be unimpeded by us. We want to make sure that we're meeting the needs so it's signaling to that plant to grow. To grow. And golly, we could talk all day long. And I seem like I am. But I throw this up here to satisfy a lot of growers. I see a lot of growers would do. Um, how much do I need to fertilize for 300 bushel corn? Now, here again, universities base a lot of their data off of old research, regression analysis, and now verification. Okay, so we had a lot of growers asking us to verify these things as we move our yields up. And, and in truth, indeed, this is based off of uptake and maintenance. That's how we formulated ours. Others are different, but quite honestly, we see basically the same types of results. Now, right, a medium testing soil, typically in, in P and K and magnesium and calcium, is that we would suggest to you that there's about a 50-50 chance of getting a response to fertilizer. That's not maintenance. That's just straight response to yield. If there is a low one, you got an 80% chance. Woo, that's good, that's better. But you kind of expect that, all right? We, we will expect that. So here, if you don't pay the piper this year, you're gonna to have to pay next year because you fixed it to take off a tremendous amount of potash. I mean, if you're taking the stover off, if you leave the stover there, not at all. Uh, so for the cattlemen, for people that have livestock industry, and I see that going off sometimes, other times it's right there, potash will be there. Phosphorus not. Where you have chicken litter, you're happy to send phosphorus off, okay? We're using a lot of phosphorus, putting a lot of phosphorus out there, we're, we're very glad for it to be removed in high yield ground. Yes, sir, back here in the back. Yeah, how can you grow the I get you. Yeah, cheating. I didn't say, oh God, I didn't say that. <laughs> I live in Georgia. <laughs> All right, but, but yeah. great. I'm sorry. I don't have an answer for you. I'll clarify it. All right, but this is really, to me, is less important. It's more important about, you know, this part is, okay? What's more important, really, is verifying your, let me go back to this, is verifying your nutrient status and doing your work on your farm. And here again, I'm going, I'm going to direct this to, to Richard and, and to Bob. Um, when we look, and, and here again, we want to look at this, 4%, 3%, 2.5%, okay? And then I'm going to take you to this study, okay? When we look at ear lease sufficiency, and this is Tony Vine's work, you know, he was demonstrating, and ultimately, that when you look at our sufficiency ranges at the top yield area in, in these particular studies, you can see that it fits fairly, you know, we can get a pretty decent fit, all right? Albeit, regression curves are in, in pretty decent shape. I like to see that as we move into the higher yield environments, we're gonna find that, indeed, our labs and our levels are sufficient to meet the need. But here's the caveat. We're just now in the throes, really, of pushing these yields with these hybrids. And when I go into these fields, um, Richard, and when I'm pulling tissue analysis and replicate them and then pulling in their spots, okay, and looking at them, they all exceed our levels. They all. Instead of 4% nitrogen, 5% nitrogen, we're talking about 6 and 7% nitrogen. Not 0.5% phosphorus, but 0.6, 0 0.7% phosphorus. And sustaining potash, same way, 6%, 5%, not 4%. So my, that begs me to ask the question, as a scientist, how do we do that? Because in all my studies, even 300 bushels, I can do that in our sufficiency range. But we're having a hard time breaking out of that. 
consistently breaking out of that. And it tells me, literally, I think, it probably goes all the way back to the very beginning is not being a part of stress because I can always point to certain levels in the year that I find some stress taking plant place that I think reduces plant growth rate and that is so hard to measure for us you know it is but we want we don't want to be a part of that problem right so I think over the years land-grant institutions I hope we'll be able to begin to measure differences. I can't guarantee them, but right now all I can say is verification trials demonstrate to us that we have sufficient levels in our current ranges. But I think if we're gonna break that mold and try to sustain these higher levels of yield, we're probably gonna to need to push early on these higher levels. We want to make sure the plant growth rate is unimpeded as we're continuing to move forward and signaling hormone-wise, not faking it, but signaling hormone-wise, I got a happy environment. Grow. Give me as much as I possibly can. Okay? This is some of Tony's work, doing some nitrogen studies, looking at uh, uh, hybrids at a rate of 32,000 plants per acre. For me, and, and what's important for me, is to look at the reproductive uptake to give me some idea of how much nutrition is still left to go and the importance of having it prior to the reproductive phase and at that reproductive and beyond it. And if you'll notice right here, guys, this is not unusual. We've been measuring 65 to 70 percent of nitrogen uptake uh, by, uh, by silking phase. I get that. I see it. 30 percent is left to be taken up. If you start seeing yellowing early in those bottom leaves, if you start seeing it run out, then you recognize that silking phase, guys, we're in trouble. We're going to lose some. That's it. So here's the key. This is the things we need to look at, little tools, little diagnostic sort of philosophy. When you walk out and when you walk out in the field, you're looking for your problem. You're looking to see if I could made a mistake early on. The one that <laughs> bothers me the most is this. You got that 30 pounds of phosphorus out there, 45% of phosphorus uptake. So 50 55 percent of phosphorus uptake is reproductive phase in corn. Well, it's the kernel, it's the kernel demand. It's that that's what's going on there. That's why I like chicken litter. I'll just be honest with you. I, and I told folks earlier, I like chicken litter. Why? Because I can see litter, see the deposition from that organic, inorganic side picking up phosphorus. Okay. Over a long term period of time, warmer soils, wetter conditions throughout that phase, getting much more phosphorus. I like that. All right. But I don't have an answer up front. All I'm doing is we're doing starter fertilizers, okay, placement, giving, making sure because of cold, wet conditions, we get enough phosphorus in that plant. And I'm going to tell you something, guys. And this is something we need to, I need to, you know, we all need to be thinking about. Uh, Bob, you made this statement too, and I agree fully with you because I made the statements as well. That sometimes we see an effect in starkness and sometimes we don't see effect, yield effect. It, to me, it's in somewhat inconsequential to the total amount of nutrition or nutrients that's going to be taken up in that plant. It's relatively minor. When you look at a V3, V4 plant, you know, it's just, it's just a few pounds of P. It's just a few pounds of nitrogen. It's not that. It's the effect on that growth rate early on those roots. That's where the effect comes from. You may have enough nutrition in the year that start is not a, you know, the, you know, the NP and K is not a problem. The plant's going to grow. It's going to be a, it's going to be growing at its maximum rate, whether you know bright sunshine days, warm days. You're not going to see that effect. But if it's struggling, if the roots are struggling, having that nutrition right there will have a positive effect on that root, on that root growth, and thus have a positive effect on homeowner reduction and signaling to that plant, I'm maxing out growth rate as well as I can with the kind of environment I've got. That's the type of, type of effect. So it's, it's less, we need to think, to me, I need to think about less about what the, this scheme is and more about growth rate. That's what I'm thinking about, okay? Here again, um, we're moving through this whole profile of stress and fertility. And this was one that disturbs me uh, greatly. Uh, Dr. Prosco 
went to uh, one of Randy's fields, just general fields here, he's making 290 bushel corn, and he said, I, you know, Randy, I want to put a little uh, wheat study out, and, um, and he did, so he used Roundup, atrazine, ammonium, uh, sulfate, and he looked at the timing effect, and if you, you know, if we stay in that, that labeled phase, guys, here we are, resting at 290 bushels, and then all of a sudden, once we got to this V7, V8 stage, where we fell off into that reproductive phase, the p-value was 0.14. Most of us, most scientists say, I want a 0.05 or 95% confidence level, 90% confidence level. I can sort of suggest to you that the effect is due to whatever my treatment is. Okay? This one's 86. CVs are 6.56. Bob likes it three. I wish I could get that. <laughs> Bob's better at it than I am. I don't know about you, Rich. I'm sure you're probably there too. Right? But here we are. 80% confidence level that it was due to this particular treatment. 40 bushels different. So we did it next year. Or he did. 2015, he didn't go far enough. He did not get into his, uh, this is uh, to a V8 stage, guys. And no difference. P value, LSD at 10, 14 bushels <coughs> difference, guys. 308 in the non treated. 313 uh, there at the end. Take home message is make sure that we're not part of the problem and that we're exceeding labels, but also expect effects and yield sometimes. Yeah, Bob? So are you suggesting that first year was because of damage to the corn plants or because of the horror? No, okay. Great question. Thank you for bringing that up. Half the time I failed to answer that question. It was nothing about weed control because we he went he went in and we hand weeded the non-treatment. So we had no weeds. It's simply chemistry. Okay? But Bob, you know, it, it's it's these effects sometimes that frustrate us. Alright, now I'll, I'll go to this one. Uh, well let me make the statement. We should always Pay closer attention to the hybrid herbicide interaction. And the companies chart these for you. And that's very, very important because we have such a plethora of chemistries to use. We really need to understand that interaction. Because even sometimes the environment is not on our side. So here are chemistries, guys that we've used that there's probably hundreds of thousands of environmental years out there that suggest they're perfectly safe. Some year something's going to happen to a hybrid that's typically maybe a little bit of sensitive and that's what you get. Normal rates, normal planting conditions out of your hands and away. What I'm saying to you guys is sometimes we don't get it. We don't understand the interactions. We don't understand the injury. And it happens. But as we move to these higher yield environments, the sensitivity, here's, here's the key to me. We remove the larger stresses. And as we're refining the agronomy of that plant, now we're beginning to measure the smaller impact. That's the key. We're measuring more smaller. And so as we move in these environments and all of a sudden we have this great condition, we sort of unmask that plant and that plant's going to be pretty blasted sensitive, I think, to some of the other effects. And we're going to see that. But, you know, guess what? We may be at 325 bushels versus 275 bushel environment. That's okay. You know, unless we drop that back to about a 290. And then we're frustrated. You know, the fun part about it in my job in Georgia is I have irrigated growers, and some of you are part of this already, I can promise you, who are disappointed when they say, I got 900 bushels, I got 900 acres of corn, and do all I average was 260 bushels. Slap me upside the head. Yeah. I'm so happy about that. I'm glad you're disappointed. You know? That's what? Rejecting status quo. That's wanting to operate in a continuous mode of improvement. And I suggest that we continue to do that. And I suggest I need to keep going on. All right, here we go. I'm screwing things up here. I want to keep moving forward here, guys. Let me, let me lay out a couple of studies for you. Uh, here's a study 
that really is the number that shows you the impact of light. The number of kernels that develop on a plant is determined by the amount of light received by the plant during that two to three week period around <laughs> silking as well as the resulting growth rate. Remember that word, growth rate. Right? And indeed this is true. As that cob is beginning to extend, right, the two weeks prior to and that week after the number of kernels, guys, the number of kernels there on that develop on that plant. In other words, that are going to feel, start feeling, are affected around that silky period. Now, we look at the, the critical period for kernel numbers coincides with rapid ear elongation. Water and light stress affect on affect kernel number and ear length at different developmental stages. And this is what we've got right here. When you're looking at the most effect, most negative effect is right there at that silken phase, right? Guys, right in the middle of this rapid growth phase. All right, here we go. Let me get to this one. Kernel set in both the water depths and low light tre uh, treatments correlate with light photosynthesis at pollination. This is a result of that slight reduction of carbohydrates to ears in the breakdown of that sugars, okay, into feeding those tips. That's why sometimes we lose those tips. It may be because of pollination or it may be because of that particular stress. Now here, let's see, I'm trying to remember what my next slide is. I want to give you a snapshot. This is a really broad brush I'm going to paint with next, okay? And, and I appreciate the use by Pioneer. We like to measure uh, light. We like to measure that effect on yield. And here you've got different growth period times, uh, grain field, V8 to V7 stage, different types of varieties. But here is, um, we're looking at this, these yellow bars above this line is the deviation, okay, from a 10-year average. Right? So that's solar, radi solar radiation by day above the 10-year average. And this is an accumulative solar, solar radiation from that 10-year average. Now I want you to look at this. This is 2012 data. We averaged 241 bushels here. And I want you to stare at this chart, all right? Because I'm fixing to show you 2013. We had a cloudy wet here, all right? Everybody staring at the chart? Then you look at this line right here. Once you stare at it, look at it, that was the next year. So you see the numbers of days of above average solar radiation during this period right here of that week to two week, guys, there wasn't a single day there. And on the average of the same hybrids, we lost, we went to we lost 30 bushels, okay, in that average. So this is a broad brushing effect of what solar radiation can do or undo. So what am I saying? We can reduce as much stress as we possibly can, okay? But yet, the big picture sometimes, light can really undo a lot of things. But I'm gonna tell you nothing new. I'm glad I did everything there because the other effect is typically even more, less yield. So I'm still pushing, still capturing. These guys, we're lucky if we get that in that cloudy weather condition, just general irrigation. You think about what 30 bushels uh, does for you. It's a tremendous amount of yield, guys, all right? So I just want to remind you that as we go through, and I'm going to get this, I'm going to quickly get into uh, a little bit about irrigation, but here's the important part, guys. It's what we do for the very beginning will naturally, I think, affect what happens here and here and here in these yield components by setting up a maximized growth rate. By signaling to this plant that I've got great conditions here, if we continue to reduce stress here, we have great conditions here and here. Right? And that, to me, is the key in pushing and capturing that yield potential, all right? Diseases, guys, it's, it, it goes unsaid here. Nematodes, the same way. Uh, in our sandy soils, we have tremendous nematode populations. All of these types of things, we have to reduce stress, okay? When you get in a situation like this at planting time, you're done, it's screwed, forget it, all right? <laughs> I'm serious, it's hard to measure out any type of yield when we have stings. Stubby roots, 
we can push through, I mean, uh, uh, root knots, we can sort of push through. Those are endoparasites. When you have an ectoparasite, guys, when it's feeding on the outside of that root, it is killing it. Your root mass suffers tremendously under an endoparasite. An endoparasite is different because this will be in that plant. You will allow that plant to still pull up nutrients. You will allow that plant to still pull up water and the effect is less. So the importance of identifying that nematode is extreme. Okay? Different types of fungicides to use. They don't all work the same on, on the different diseases. Uh, simple, if you've got disease pressure, we see significant improvements in our yield. We can apply, if you've got a fungicide, if you've got an irrigation capabilities and you can put out 0.1 to 0.3 tenths of an inch of water minimum, okay, preferably 0.1 to 0.2, then you can successfully apply a fungicide through that pivot, successfully. If you cannot reduce and slow that uh, pivot down to that level, then you're gonna have to rely on ground or area at that point in time, okay? Here is a uh, approach Prima 6.8 at R1 stage chemigated, rust severity 15%, infection was 14 days after ear leaf, here 30% untreated, okay? Here was a, another field, rust severity 7%, one ear leaf at, uh, I mean, uh, ear leaf 14 days after, okay? Approach at V5, Approach uh, at R1, 7%, here again, 30%, no effect there, guys. So if you look at this approach, both of them uh, at V5 chemigated 28 days after planting, 40%, a uh, 40% a reduction in half, okay, simply through irrigation, get that. All right, guys, just a few more minutes here. Here's, one I want, here's what I want to suggest to you. Uh, we've been doing work looking and using sensor technology and comparing sensors and irrigation by sensor and irrigation by ET water balance. And over the years what we're finding quite honestly is that we can do an equal if not better job using ET. I use sensors to help verify what I know and feel like is happening. So I'm looking to see what the sensors technology is going to tell me underground so that I can continue to have a level of confidence, all right? What's important is to know that as we move through our growing, uh, growing degree days and our yield components, guys, our greatest effect comes when in our greatest need, water need. Georgia, we're using about 0.3 inches, this happens to be to work out of Florida, uh, about 0.3 Depending on your ET, total ET, and, how, and the temperature for that day, and how dry it might be, we might suck up 0 0.34, 0 0.35, 0 0.36 even, all right? So that means, in some cases, we're trying to apply a half an inch of water per day to meet the demand during that pollination stage. Some guys apply more, but the infiltration rate will not allow them to get water in that profile, so you have to look at the infiltration rate of your soils to make sure that you're not moving water off that field but you're continuing to apply. And if you can get through and meet the demands on that pivot with a half an inch, I suggest to you during that period of time, you're much, much better off. Why? Two things are going on. You will notice the temperature change is cooler in that canopy, right? which tells me two things. One, I'm having a positive effect on the temperature with the water that I'm applying from a stomate problem. You know, stomates are open, transpiration is taking place, and we're keeping that plant cooler. Very, very important. All right. What are the common mistakes? And I will do this in two minutes. Not irrigating early enough. I want it to secure an even emergence. If I plant, if I'm going to plant and I got dry soil, I'm going to water. I want even emergence. I'm underestimating demand. I deplete subsoil moisture. You cannot ever catch up. Once you, if, if you do not meet the need in the early stages of that plant and you exhaust that subsoil and push that crop to pull water up from that soil, you will never catch up in the life of that plant. It's just literally impossible because it's hard to even meet the demand on an average day. All right? Not irrigating long enough, we reduce test weight before black layers form. Okay, so there's so many things that go into this. I won't bore you with these particular details, but here's the things you want to look at. You definitely want to look at the efficiency of your system. Some plant needs are seven 
0.75 inches, but expect efficiencies of about 85%, which means you might need to apply 0.8 inches if you're underestimating your demand. Please know that part of it. These curves are, are set throughout the um, uh, lots of databases around the country, guys. Nebraska is a good place. Uh, Delaware uh, is forming uh, some great information. I'm very excited about what you guys are doing here. All right. And, uh, and the use, these charts are available probably in each of your states. Uh, this is very important, but here, let me get to this part. Here's the sensor technology, guys, broken up. This is a Decagon uh, biometric water supply. What I'm looking to do is try to keep it above this 15%. I think this level of stress uh, is, and we hit a stress period of time uh, when we were not getting uh, rainfall. These black bars down here represent rainfall. These blue bars, irrigation, we were getting sufficient amount of, of rainfall. And then as we started, the ET began to rise and then even guess what? My pivot in this field wasn't putting out enough light. And it took me about one, two, took me two applications to figure that out. I realized, oh Jesus, we got a problem. And we went out and we looked at it, tested it, and realized we were not getting enough water out. This is a great thing. This is how we use sensor technology. This is, uh, in fact, these are water marks. Here again, the same period of time, you can see the results here. We want to try to keep our soil tension below 30 centibars, okay? When we do that, when we have sensor technology that says, okay, we're into some stress zone, indeed we are. We're into some stress zone. So that's what this technology can do for us, guys. It's also very important to do the last thing is to look at a, that upper edge and that lower uh, time frame so that you can max and keep and make sure that you're meeting the demands because 50% of that moisture, of that water demand at about V12 and beyond is coming from that lower soil profile. Guys, I know you need to go. Thank you so very much. I appreciate you coming today. We'll do. Yes, we'll do.